Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. My name is Wendy Heaps, and I'll be the moderator for this afternoon's Earned Income Tax Credits and Health webinar, hosted by CDC's Office of the Associate Director for Policy and Strategy. We'll hear from Elizabeth Skillen, Senior Policy Advisor from OADPS, as well as three presenters from external partner organizations. Today's webinar will be recorded and uploaded to the CDC website. We will send out an email with an update to access the recording when it has been posted. If you have any general questions or specific questions for any of our presenters, please use the Q&A functionality located in the bottom taskbar in Zoom. We will have some time at the end of the presentations for questions and answers. We'll try to get to as many as we have time for. Any questions that we are unable to respond to on the webinar will be addressed in the subsequent wrap-up email. Now, without further delay, we will turn it over to our first presenter, Elizabeth Skillen. Thanks so much, Wendy, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Skillen, a Senior Policy Advisor from the Office of the Associate Director for Policy and Strategy here at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm also the lead for a community health initiative called the Health Impact in Five Years, or High Five Initiative. High Five is part of our office's work to identify evidence-based policy interventions that can improve health and advance health equity. Next slide, please. Today, I am super excited to host and co-host with my colleague, Wendy, um, a panel of experts that participated in CDC's first High Five Earned Income Tax Credit Policy Implementation Lab. The panelists provided expertise and resources on increasing uptake of earned income tax credits through innovative partnerships. And today we're gonna to learn about opportunities from these national partners working to increase uptake of EITCs and case examples for public health to engage with partners working on economic security and perspectives from one of our uh, EITC policy participants in Massachusetts. So we will hear from Annalise Grimm, the Associate Program Director at Code for America. Code for America is an organization that works shoulder to shoulder with community organizations and government to build digital tools and services and, and improve programs through partnerships, empowerment, and transformation. In this role, Annalise led the organization's Workforce Dis Diversity Project, excuse me, Workforce Discovery Project, which resulted in the creation of GetYourRefund.org. She will share lessons learned from Get Your Refund to help ensure all families can access the tax benefits to which they are entitled. Next, we'll hear from Richard Schuer, Director of Innovative Partnerships, Children's Health Watch. Children's Health Watch is a nonpartisan network of pediatricians, public health researchers, and children's health and policy experts that are committed to improving children's health in America. In this role, Richard leads the cross-sector policy work and initiatives of the organization. He identifies and executes a wide range of projects grounded in research and policy analysis to inform decision makers and improve children's health. Richard participated in our EITC policy implementation lab, and so we're excited to have him here. And finally, we will hear from Rebecca Thompson, the director of the network, excuse me, director of network building at Prosperity Now. Prosperity Now is a national nonprofit intermediary whose work makes it possible for millions of people to achieve financial security and contribute to an opportunity economy. In this role, Rebecca leads the Taxpayer Opportunity Network, which connects, strengthens, and inspires community tax programs so that they can more effectively and efficiently deliver critical tax assistance to low and moderate income taxpayers. Next slide. So, so excited to hear from our panelists. I am going to kick us off by sharing some framing on health equity social determinants of health, uh, describing and describe the connection between health and earned income tax credits. I will also share some tools and resources developed by the CDC Foundation 
that CDC used as part of the EITC policy implementation lab. Next slide. Health equity is central to CDC's work as the nation's public health agency and refers to a world where every person has the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential. And no one is disadvantaged from achieving this because of social position or other socially determined circumstances. We know that differences in health are striking in communities with poor social determinants of health, such as unstable housing, low income, unsafe neighborhoods, or substandard education. The goal is that by applying what we know about social determinants of health and providing tools for action on this work, we can not only improve population health, but also reduce these health disparities and begin to address health equity. Next slide. Social determinants of health are conditions in the environment where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health functioning and quality of life outcomes and risks. Healthy People 2030 identifies economic stability as one of the five domains of social determinants. And one example that contributes to economic stability is income. In the United States, one in 10 people live in poverty. There is a well-established relationship between income and health, especially between poverty and poor health. Income can change people's risk for one or more chronic diseases like heart disease, diabetes, and stroke. Many low-income families are unable to afford health insurance and health care, and they frequently do not have enough income to live in safe communities with adequate housing and schools. In many cases, low-income families do not have access to healthy food, parks, or other physical activity facilities, or all of which and should improve health. Additionally, strong evidence consistently links low income to adverse childhood experiences or ACEs exposures and children's long-term health, educational, and social outcomes. Next slide. This is the public health impact pyramid, a framework for action. It shows the potential impact of different types of public health interventions. At the base are interventions that have the greatest potential for health. They can reach entire communities at once and require less individual effort. At the bottom, you can see High Five reference. High Five initiative focuses on social determinants of health and includes 14 evidence-based interventions seen here in the two boxes on the slide. Earned Income Tax Credits, or EITCs, are one of them. I-5 was developed in response to requests for information and assistance from public health officials at the local and state levels of government. It fulfills an unmet need among CDC's partners for targeted scientific data and analysis on SDOH for health interventions, as well as evidence briefs that can lead to positive health outcomes in five years or less. The bottom tier is where EITC sit that address income, a social determinants of health, and has that greatest potential for achieving positive health impact and achieving health equity. Evidence is critical to success, yet to work to address social determinants, we must engage in work across sectors. This work is hard and takes time to look for opportunities for collaborations that meet our population health goals. So I'd like to share more about what EITCs are and CDC's work on building collaborations to address social determinants. Next slide. An earned income tax credit is a benefit for working people with low to moderate income designed to incentivize work and help reduce poverty, particularly for families with children. It's an income credit that can be levied at the federal, state, and local levels in order to reduce the tax burden for low to moderate income working people. An EITC can act as an additional source of income when applied as a with fundable credit like the federal EITC and many state EITCs. For example, a single mom with two kids who works minimum wage earns about earning about $15,000 a year. She would qualify for the federal EITC at a maximum of $5,920. With a 10% 10 refundable state EITC, provided that she didn't have additional tax liability, state tax liability, she would receive about 580 additional dollars. 
that translates to two weeks wages or a month worth of groceries or half months rent. So by reducing poverty and increasing income for working families, EITC has been linked to positive health outcomes, particularly for infants and mothers. CDC developed evidence briefs for EITC and has worked over the last few years to learn how public health can help other sectors implement EITC. So I'd like to start to talk a little bit about the High Five Partnership Consortium Project led by the CDC Foundation, who worked with the Public Health Institute and was funded by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Next slide. The focus of the High Five Partnership Consortium Project was to help public health practitioners build capacity to implement community-wide interventions by learning the needs of practitioners and developing, developing some actionable tools. CDC served as subject matter experts on policy implementation and social determinants for the project. The lessons learned from the stakeholders involved helped to increase understanding about how partners working on income insecurity and public health could work together. The High Five Partnership Consortium goals included describing contexts that underline the development and implementation of EITC, identifying mechanisms that might explain why certain examples or cases are successful for this work, and identifying ways that public health has informed and supported EITC policies generally and as a tool to improve the social determinants of health. Next slide. To meet the project goals, the project team conducted a series of key informant interviews with stakeholders in four states, including California, New Mexico, Ohio, and Louisiana. All the key informants represented organizations dedicated to ending poverty. The project team then hosted a convening or an EITC deep dive on June 26, 2019, with participant, participants from California, Georgia, Kansas, Massachusetts, New Mexico, and Virginia. The purpose of this deep dive was to explore practices related to the EITC policy development and implementation, and to discuss the role of public health. Next slide. As a result of this stakeholder process, CDC Foundation developed products to increase awareness about EITC as a health intervention and to inform public health practice. One of these was the EITC Action Guide designed to describe options for further engaging public health with those working on income insecurity. It can be found um, in a in addition to a comprehensive final report on the CDC Foundation's website that's listed here on the slide, and it also details lessons from the field from the High Five Consortium project. Next slide. Here's an example of some of the content in the EITC Action Guide. The guide includes information on EITCs, how EITCs keep more families and children above the poverty line, and their link with positive health outcomes, especially among mothers and children. And the CDC Foundation's goal for this guide is to educate public health practitioners on the benefits of EITCs and provide them with the data that can be used to inform families, partners, and decision makers. Next slide. Despite the health benefits of EITCs that I've described, one in five eligible workers don't claim their EITC. The guide describes some actions that practitioners can take to increase access, including raising awareness and use of federal EITC with reminders, flyers, social media messages, and referrals. Or use, using the tax season as an opportunity to inform people about free tax preparation assistance. Next slide. The guide also describes actions for public health to collaborate with others working to address poverty, including reaching out to anti-poverty and child-serving groups or local economic development organizations or hosting a volunteer tax preparation service in, in a particular organization's area. So CDC was very interested in learning from this EITC action guide and test what the CDC foundation had learned with a set of practitioners 
through a pilot EITC policy implementation lab. Next slide. The CDC partnered with the National Network of Public Health Institutes and the Georgia Health Policy Center to launch a pilot EITC policy implementation lab. The purpose of the EITC policy lab is to build public health practitioners' capacity to engage in multi-sector partner coalitions and implement evidence-based policies that advance population health improvement. The lab had representatives from five states, Arizona, California, Massachusetts, Utah, and Louisiana, all who are working to engage in cross-sector collaboration to increase the uptake of EITC in their locales. So we're excited to share some of the learnings from our experts who participated and who supported the EITC policy implementation lab, as well as case examples that highlight options to consider when implementing this effective intervention. Next slide. I'd really like to acknowledge that many colleagues have supported this work along the way in aiding our learning. Next slide. As well as a warm thanks to those who've contributed to furthering our knowledge and participating in the EITC policy implementation lab. Next slide. Many thanks for your time for joining us today. I look forward to hearing from our participants um, and our panelists. Back to you, Wendy. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was great. Now we'll turn things over to Annalise Grimm from Code for America. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, thanks for having me. My name is Annalise Grimm, the director or associate director of GetYourRefund.org at Code for America. And it's my privilege to speak to you alongside our really wonderful partners at Children's Health Watch and Prosperity Now. Like Elizabeth said, Code for America is a nonprofit organization that partners with government to strengthen the delivery of public services through human-centered technology. We currently work on SNAP in California, benefits integrations in a few states, criminal record clearance, and now tax benefits. Excited to talk to you about that today. And we chose to work on the earned income tax credit because it's the biggest public benefit for workers. It provides flexible cash that allows people to address their most painful problems. We really wanted to emphasize that flexible cash. Next slide, please. So we know that workers need flexible cash and there's this huge source of cash that's available, the earned income tax credit, but many low-income households, as we just mentioned, one out of five are missing out on this money. And nationally, what that means is that low-income households are missing out on about $10.5 billion a year. That's billion with a B. And that's an average of about $1,300 for families in what we call the EITC participation gap. Next slide, please. I would love to give an example of what that looks like for one family in California, just to really drive this point home. So if this family hadn't filed for the past two years, last year they would have been eligible for $5,779 total across their credit. So that's the EITC, the Cal EITC, the additional child tax credit, and in California, a special credit called the Young Child Tax Credit. Next slide, please. And then for 2020, they would have been eligible for another $5,779 with those same credits. Next slide, please. And then when you add in the economic impact payments, also known as stimulus checks, and the advanced child tax credit, it really, really starts to add up. So we see here the two stimulus payments, the stimulus payments for their dependents. California had their own Golden State stimulus. And then looking at the advanced child tax credit, which there's lots of buzz around today, um, Adding all those things up, it's about $19,658 for that family, which is close to tripling their income for the year. So this is a huge transformative amount of money for people. And if you add to the normal EITC participation gap that we see every year, the 5 million people who are likely to be missing out on the stimulus, we're estimating there's over $16 billion left on the table by low-income families who really need and deserve that money. So in short, Doing your taxes has always been important. Now it's more important than ever. Next slide, please. So who is missing out? The best data that we have is from California and stimulus payments. So I'll, I'll talk about that data. As with many of the programs we work on at Code for America, those who need the benefits the most are most likely to be missing out. So in this case, 25% of eligible safety net enrollees are missing out on the stimulus in California. And safety net enrollees identified as Native American or Alaska Native are the highest risk for being in the gap. 
and Hispanic or Latinx enrollees make up the largest share of the gap. So those are folks we're particularly trying to make sure we reach. Next slide, please. And we see a lot of disparity nationally in participation as well. This is 2017 participation by state with the yellow showing states that have the largest gap. So California is a place we focus, not just because it's where we're based, but because there's a huge participation gap in California. Next slide, please. So like I said before, one out of five households are missing out. We wanted to understand if there's so much money available, why are people leaving this money on the table? There must be something deeper going on here. And so we conducted user research in California and Colorado and started to see some really clear patterns and why eligible people file or don't file. So why don't people file? They don't think they have to file their taxes and they don't realize that they might benefit from doing so is a big piece. Second, this actually kind of surprised us, but um, in retrospect, we should have expected it. Emotional hardship interrupted their lives. So we saw a lot of people who stopped filing because of things like job loss, a death of a family member or divorce. It really disrupted their situation and made it hard for them to file. And frankly, seeing themselves represented on paper in a way that was um, different than how they wanted to see themselves also contributed to them not being able to file. Um, third, being overwhelmed by trying to understand the ambiguous and sometimes negative consequences of filing and wanting to know how that might impact other public benefits or their broader financial situation. So um, people being fearful of filing and, and how it might play out in other parts of their financial story. And then lastly, trustworthy, affordable help is hard to find where they are when they need it. And looking at all of these factors, we can really see, and we also see in the data consistently that outreach alone is important, but it's not enough to overcome these challenges. We really need to get people better services. Next slide. So we took in all that research and all the stories that we heard, and we used that to inform our service at getyourrefund.org. And we knew we had to build something that was free and trustworthy. So those two things don't have to be mutually exclusive. People expressed greater trust in free tax help that's linked to nonprofits or with government. It needed to be clarifying. People need to be able to ask questions. Often there was one question that someone had that blocked them from filing. Once you answered that question, they were confident moving forward with filing their taxes. It needed to be thorough. So we ran into a lot of folks who had complicated situations needing to file for several years or had self-employment income or scholarships. We needed to build something that would be able to serve everyone. And it needed to be accessible for people whenever they are, wherever they are ready. So if someone's ready at 3 a.m. when they finally get their kids to bed and they are up looking at their tax documents, we wanted to have something that they could tap into. And among the available services that we looked at, we did a landscape analysis of what the, the services are out there. We saw that VITA, the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program, provides that trustworthy clarifying and thorough service and has an accuracy rate, which is higher than paid preparers, very high quality service and very trusted in community. But VITA struggled to meet demand. And so we thought that potentially digital services could help VITA expand and we decided to pilot fully online intake and case management with FIDA for the 2020 tax season and get your refund was born. Next slide, please. So now I'll skip ahead a little bit just to tell you what Get Your Refund currently supports to serve the diverse needs of clients. So we have a VITA site location finder for people who are seeking fully in-person services, keeping in mind that VITA sites are often seasonal, so service can be limited in the off-season. We also have what we call Valet Vita, which is a way for clients to drop off documents with the Vita provider, get those taxes prepared, and then come back to pick them up. So it's a shorter wait time than waiting to have the taxes prepared in real time. We have Digital Intake, which is a way to submit all of your tax documents online. That's at getyourrefund.org. And then you work with the volunteer over the phone to prepare your taxes and submit them. And then we also have DIY with help. So this is free tax prep software. And I just want to emphasize there are a lot of things out there that say that they are free that can trick people in certain situations into paying. And so um, we are very thoughtful about making sure we have an actually free service there through TaxSlayer. Um, and it's a great resource for people when VITA sites are closed or if there's a capacity limitation, the DIY service is a way for people to consistently be able to file their taxes. And then we have service routing. So that's chat support on our website where people can ask questions, whether it's about the CTC, the child tax credit, uh, stimulus, other tax related issues, we can provide referrals and direct people to the service that would be most appropriate. And then very big news yesterday, we launched getctc.org. Again, that's getctc.org, which is a website designed specifically for families who are seeking to access the new advanced child tax credit. Next slide, please. 
So what happened in 2021? It was a wild year in the tech space for a lot of reasons, but um, we were very successful in scaling, get your refund and being able to serve a lot of clients. So we worked with 106 FIDA partners across 40 states and were able to serve partners in all, or serve clients in all 50 states. We had 7,000 users in the system. So that's FIDA staff and volunteers who are helping people prepare their taxes remotely. We prepared 83,000 returns and delivered at least 313 million. That doesn't include the advanced CTC. So that's just in the um, state and federal tax credits that were delivered for the 2020 season. Um, and then we conducted qualitative and quantitative research to really learn how to effectively reach non filers, overcome what we call the document burden. So how people access their tax documents and ID documents, verifying identity, and then scaling high quality virtual support. And based on that experience of serving over 800,000 clients through some form of our services at getyourrefund.org, we learned a few key things that I want to share with you because I think um, that some of them were surprises for us. So first, again, we saw that broad outreach alone is insufficient to convert non-filers into filers, and outreach really needs to be targeted, informed by data, and paired with high-quality accessible services. Second, that current identity verification processes unnecessarily exclude marginalized filers, and we need to build inclusive ID verification processes that, yes, prevent ID theft, but make sure that they don't block families from accessing benefits, which is currently unfortunately happening a lot. Um, and third, many of the most marginalized non-filers can't complete a full tax return even with the support of VITA right now. So it's incredibly important to create streamlined processes to allow non-filers to access benefits like the child tax credit and economic impact payments without filing a full tax return. And then fourth, there is a role for community-based navigators, community-based organizations, public benefits agencies. We want to see something similar to the Affordable Care Act navigators where community-based folks who are trusted can help hard to reach clients navigate access to tax benefits. So how can you help us out in reaching non-filers in your community? Government partnerships are by far the best way for us to reach people. And we'd love to partner with you for the next tax season. There are two key ways you can do that. One is through outreach partnerships. We are focusing our outreach efforts on families that are likely to be in the participation gap, whether that's for EITC, the stimulus, or the child tax credit. And that's statistically most likely to be folks who are on public benefits. So um, we want to make sure we're reaching out to you all there. Um, and we can provide a unique URL that will allow us to track your outreach. So that can create a feedback loop where if you're doing something on social media or you're putting it on your website or you're sending out letters to the community, we can give you different URLs for people to type in that will allow us to show you which of your outreach mechanisms are working most effectively so that you can really reinvest in those and, and focus on what's working. And then we also have navigator partnerships. And this is really the next level of partnership with getyourrefund.org. It's designed to help reach clients that can't access Get Your Refund on their own, whether that's due to language barriers, technology, trust, or other factors. It can be done in person or remotely. And our hope here is that it will make our VITA sites even more efficient by ensuring that the clients are truly ready for tax prep. So we want to make sure they have their tax documents, they have their ID documents, and when they're uploading all their information in to get your refund, it's really a case that's ready to be prepared by our tax preparers. And for the most robust version of this, um, it requires about three or four hours of training to be fully trained and certified to answer basic questions. There are also lighter lift versions of this as well that are sort of in between outreach and referral and navigation. Um, and we'll be happy to talk more about that. So I will leave it there. Thank you so much for having me and looking forward to the conversation. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Rich Sheward from Children's Health Watch based at Boston Medical Center. And I'm thrilled to be here with you all this afternoon. And uh, today I will be presenting um, a state level journey on how Massachusetts came to reimagine its state level EITC as a policy to improve children's health. We can go to the next slide. So over the next 10 minutes, we're gonna, I'll share this case study best presented in three stages. First, the successes. I'll share the history of the state EITC in Massachusetts and the ways in which it was reimagined and improved over time. 
And then I'll talk a little bit about the sustainability. So what is the uh, power behind collaboration among diverse stakeholders to have an outsized impact when the rubber finally meets the road? And then third, I'll touch on the systems, the levers to make sure that implementation is successful by institutionalizing improvements to the EITC and also addressing barriers that we uh, inevitably find over time with implementation. So those are the three things that I'm gonna focus on uh, this afternoon. We can go to the next slide. Like many other states in the US, Massachusetts has a state level earned income tax credit that essentially acts as a boost or a piggyback to the federal EITC. And for many years, uh, at least since the 1990s, the Massachusetts EITC had been set at 15% of the federal credit. And I have to give credit to a number of agencies and institutions um, who had done research on the effectiveness and the impact of the EITC, especially in reducing poverty among recipients and taxpayers. And it um, was really uh, not until 2015, um, which is a, a another story for another day, but it was a policy window that had opened up in the Commonwealth that really motivated lawmakers to reconsider that uh, state level EITC and increase it from 15% uh, to 23% of the federal EITC in 2015. And one aspect of why that was successful was a number of groups coming together, um, in this case, forming the Healthy Families EITC Coalition to help raise awareness and understanding that the Earned Income Tax Credit is not just a policy that reduces poverty and lifts many families um, out of poverty, but also improves health. And so bringing together legal aid agencies, policy think tanks, anti-poverty groups, community development corporations, social service agencies, healthcare agencies, even state and local public health uh, commissions, and most importantly, families themselves, we were able to reframe the earned income tax credit as not just an anti-poverty program, um, but a child health tax credit. So I mentioned that there had been uh, you know, decades of research on the effectiveness of the EITC. There had also been research on how things like adverse childhood experiences, toxic stress, health-related social needs are often rooted in the interplay between poverty, economic insecurity, stress, depression, and material hardships. But at that time, a small and growing body of evidence was linking that to the earned income tax credit. And so the Healthy Families EITC Coalition shone a light on how the EITC had begun to uh, show that it was associated with the reduced incidence of low birth weight births, that children and families receiving the EITC had better health outcomes in other ways. Mothers were reporting uh, less um, instances of depression and stress, better um, nutrition uh, outcomes as well. And this body of evidence has grown since 2015. And I have to give a lot of credit to the CDC and the High Five Initiative in making this uh, sort of a national platform that the EITC is linked to health. So we really stood on the shoulders of uh, many researchers over time. And since 2015, the state has increased the EITC and improved it in a few other ways. In 2017, we were the first state to um, expand eligibility of the state EITC to survivors of domestic violence, fleeing their abusers. In 2018, most recently, the credit was increased to 30% of the federal credit where it currently stands today. We can go to the next slide. So I shared a little bit about the history of the policy, how it evolved, how the perception of it changed from anti-poverty to anti-poverty and health improvement. And in order to um, maintain that awareness and build on that success, uh, sustainability became a, a really important factor for us. And so I mentioned the work of the Healthy Families EITC Coalition. We're really just one group out of uh, many. And there are three, I would say, that are really active in the state, three distinct groups working to improve uh, the well-being of Massachusetts families. 
One of those groups is Massachusetts Essentials for Childhood, which is a collaboration of public and private stakeholders across multiple sectors that are focused on addressing the public health problem of child abuse and neglect funded by the Centers for Disease Control and led by the Massachusetts Department of Health. The Healthy Families EITC Coalition really focuses a lot on the messaging awareness and even policy analysis aspect of this work. And then most recently in Massachusetts, as the state has moved from a fee-for-service model of healthcare to a performance-based payment model that mainly relies on the establishment of accountable care organizations or ACOs across the state, healthcare has really stepped up to the plate in acknowledging uh, and taking into account many health-related social needs, including financial instability, and working very hard to both screen, intervene, address financial insecurity and other health-related social needs, in part by um, providing application assistance to the Earned Income Tax Credit. And so through public health, through coalition building, and through healthcare, we've been able to really sustain a lot of these partnerships and have an outsized effect that any one of our agencies would not be able to have otherwise. You can go to the next slide. So now I think what you all would like to hear is what are we doing? What is working? What are the levers that we have access to to increase uptake in the EITC and to make sure that it's a successful policy? Um, and there are four things that I think are really important that transfer to any situation in any state. Uh, number one, the importance of the volunteer income tax assistance sites across the Commonwealth are um, indispensable. There are approximately 80 of them uh, in operation across the state of Massachusetts. And, um, you know, a policy is really only as good as its implementation. And to ensure that the EITC lands in the bank account and the wallets of taxpayers in Massachusetts, it's important that they have access to free tax prep, especially for the low income tax filers. And so VITA sites are uh, an incredibly important aspect of this sort of systems approach to improving the EITC. Second is community. I talked about the three sort of big groups that are really working together um, at a statewide and systems level, um, Essentials for Childhood and the Healthy Families EITC Coalition and a number of accountable care organizations, hospitals and health systems. We were lucky to participate together in the CDC's EITC Implementation Lab, which really gave us uh, a sense of community learning. Um, and uh, we were also able to learn from what other states are doing. So education and community building is incredibly important. And then messaging as well. So earned media attention from newspapers like the Boston Globe and television stations has really taken this to the public sphere and the public consciousness, which is incredibly important. Uh, lastly, strong partnerships. So the EITC, as many of you I'm sure are aware, is uh, sort of one piece of the puzzle. Another very important piece of the puzzle, especially most recently, is the child tax credit, as well as the stimulus, uh, the economic impact payments that have happened over the past year or so. And so we've worked with groups like Greater Boston Legal Services, Mass Law Reform Institute, MassCap, and the Shaw Family Foundation to create a website, findyourfunds.org, for folks in Massachusetts to understand how they can take advantage and uh, receive the child tax credit, especially if they're uh, not, uh, they're non-filers or they don't earn enough to typically file a tax return. So partnerships to raise awareness and get the message out to the public is also incredibly important and something that we're focused on. We can go to the next slide. And so now we're at the point of thinking about not just what we do, but what matters, what's gonna have the biggest impact. So we're focused on continuing to develop our messaging to a variety of audiences, especially healthcare audiences. Um, Elizabeth mentioned earlier the commitment uh, to addressing the social determinants of health. It's having uh, a big impact in the healthcare space and um, most of the social determinants of health that are the area of focus that health systems and hospitals are identifying when they screen their patients are food insecurity and housing instability, transportation issues, 
Um, and those are all rooted in poverty in many ways. And so not only is it important to connect families to SNAP, WIC, the federal nutrition programs, emergency food assistance, transportation assistance, and housing supports, it's also important to connect families to the earned income tax credit, the child tax credit, and all of those financial stability tools that we have at our disposal. And I think that can be amplified even more. So developing messaging to healthcare providers and partners is incredibly important. Educating stakeholders on the EITC is another uh, aspect that we're focused on. Policies need education and awareness to be successful. So how is this a policy that is going to address racial income and wealth gaps? That's something that we're thinking very much about. Convening the providers, the tax pro uh, prep providers and VITA sites to really beef up their ability to provide virtual access has become a huge focus in the past year. They're a critical link um, and we need to focus on that. And as well as making the process easier for households themselves by closing the digital divide, um, both in terms of tax prep, but also virtual healthcare visits. So those are some of the things that we're thinking about in terms of what matters, how we can have an impact in the future. And then we can go to the next slide. And so this is, oh, we'll go back one slide. So this is how uh, we're uh, planning to actually uh, to do this work together. And these are strategies that we identified by participating in the EITC policy implementation lab. So number one is to continue the partnership and the work of the Healthy Families EITC Coalition to build understanding and awareness and provide analysis on the policies. And then two, support those on the ground tax prep providers. MassCap is a statewide umbrella agency that um, manages a number of community action agencies that run VITA sites. They're incredibly important as well as the Boston Tax Help Coalition that also manages a number of statewide or uh, citywide VITA sites. So making sure that we're um, really lifting up the free tax prep providers is something that we're focused on going forward. Um, and then lastly, uh, bringing healthcare providers deeper into the fold. There have been really amazing uh, contributions by organizations like Street Cred and the accountable care organizations, whether it's through Boston Children's Hospital or Boston Medical Center um, or out in Springfield, Massachusetts making sure that healthcare providers are part of the conversation is incredibly important. And so these are the ways that we're focused on implementation going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. Now we'll have our final presenter, Rebecca Thompson from Prosperity Now. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Wendy. If we can go to the next slide. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rebecca Thompson. I am the director of network building at Prosperity Now. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here with you today. And good afternoon again to all of my co-panelists, background staff, and all of you attendees. It's really great to be here with you. I'm hoping that I can share a little bit of information um, with you today that will you will find to be beneficial. So Prosperity Now is on a mission to ensure that everyone in our country has a clear path to financial stability, wealth, and prosperity. Next slide, please. The network building team within Prosperity Now fosters peer connections and provides strategic, targeted, and meaningful engagement opportunities to build strength and relationships with our community partners and stakeholders as we work to advance federal and state um, solutions, systems-oriented solutions that um, limit racial economic justice. Now, taxes are a critical element of our country's economy, and we know that tax time represents a significant moment in the financial lives of many Americans, particularly low to moderate income households. And we've heard a lot today about the difference and the significance that a tax refund can make on many of those households. The Taxpayer Opportunity Network connects, strengthens, and expire, inspires community tax programs. And our goals are really to increase the number of low-income taxpayers who access free, high-quality tax preparation services 
and to increase the number of low income taxpayers who take advantage of financial capability services and improve their household financial security at tax time. We do this in a number of ways. Particularly to accomplish these goals, we provide tools, information, resources, and foster peer connections to our VITA programs and among our VITA programs and stakeholders. Next slide, please. So here's a recap of the 2021 filing season. During the 2021 filing season, we saw a significant reduction in the number of VITA sites that were open to provide free tax prep services due primarily to the impact of COVID-19. A lot of our partners pivoted from what had been a predominantly in-person face-to-face service delivery model to offering a menu of service delivery options to meet the need in, those, in their communities. So we, we saw a lot of our VITA partners partnering with Annalise and her team with getyourrefund.org. We also saw a lot of partners implementing their own virtual processes at the local level. Um, many par partners shifted to offering more do-it-yourself services such as myfreetaxes.com, IRS free file, and other facilitated self-access options which encourage filers to prepare their own returns with assistance. Then we saw a lot of partners shifting to a drop off model wherein taxpayers would come drop off their documents, either have them scanned or copied, leave and return within a span of a week or so and pick up their completed return. And then still there were some of our partners who offered limited in person services, primarily by appointment only. Now, compounding all of the complexities associated with navigating the transition from traditional and alternative service delivery models were all of these special considerations that occurred during the filing season, either at the end of 2020 or during the 2021 filing season. So of course we had COVID-19, but then what we also saw was a lot of taxpayers presenting with prior year returns as well. Of course, there were issues with the economic impact payments and the recovery rebate credit, the EITC look back, unemployment compensation, additional premium tax credit. All of these were factors that came into play during the filing season, which our volunteers not only had to navigate a new service delivery models, but also new tax laws, which seemed to be changing at the spur of the moment. Um, and our volunteers really had to do a lot of learning on the fly midstream during the filing season to ensure that we were able to continue to prepare accurate returns. Next slide, please. So in March of 2020, as we noticed that many of our sites were shutting down and closing their doors due to COVID-19, one of the first things that we did was host a listening session. Um, and our team pulled together our partners from our network um, in an afternoon session to talk about what this meant for them, as well as what the challenges they foresaw would be in order to, in opening, reopening their sites and continuing to deliver services during the 2020 filing season. And we also listened out for opportunities. Based on what we learned and build, building on what we learned from that listening session in March, in which we also hosted a subsequent session in the end of April, we decided um, to take and really pour our resources into addressing the barriers to successfully implementing virtual VITA. So we sought to help our, help our partners make the shift. We also work to ensure and expand access to VITA programs for low income taxpayers. So we were focused primarily on the most underserved markets and the most underserved tax filers who had not yet been to a, a VITA site. And then finally, we were in, wanted to ensure that economically vulnerable house, households and five of the nation's most vulnerable communities could access high quality tax prep services for free, that they could claim the EITC and other tax credits and, and access those ancillary supports that are often provided at VITA sites to improve their household financial health during the, the pandemic. Next slide, please. So what we did, uh, 
um, was leveraging resources. We were able to provide $300,000 in technology grants to VIDA partners, to 38 VIDA partners. And these technology grants were specifically designed um, to help those partners who, in particular, were transitioning to partner with Code for America and GetYourRefund.org in the virtual service delivery models. So we provided those resources to the program so that they could purchase computers, monitors, mice, keyboards, internet access, what have you, whatever it was that our, their volunteers needed in order to participate and continue to deliver services. Additionally, we provided $500,000 in unrestricted funds to 25 VITA partners to provide some sort of sustaining resources for them and their organizations as they shifted to alternative service delivery models as well. In addition, we provided um, technical assistance to two cohorts, one of 10 programs specifically targeted towards virtual VITA and transitioning their services to the Get Your Refund platform, and another to ensuring and expanding access to clients in those most vulnerable communities across the country. And we also developed a toolkit for our partners to use to support their transition as well. Next slide, please. So from our ensuring and expanding access grant and project, we've been conducting some research. One of our goals has been to really close the gap, the EITC participation gap. And the first um, step in that has really been identifying the barriers and identifying who is not claiming the EITC. So from our preliminary research, you know, there are a few categories that we have identified for folks who are not claiming the EITC. There are existing filers who may be filing a paper return and don't know about the EITC that are not aware that they're eligible. We have existing filers who may be answering questions incorrectly on the software um, doing electronic returns. And so they may have answered a question wrong and not claimed a dependent, which would automatically you know, kick them out of eligibility for the, the EITC. And then finally, there's paid preparer error and so a lot of times that people who um, are preparing returns, the paid preparers are not required to attain the same level of certification as our VITA volunteers are. And so they are subject to error and they actually do experience higher error rates than we do in the VITA program. So those are for our existing filers. Among the non-filers um, who may be eligible for the EITC but not claiming it, we identified those who may, may not have a filing requirement, so they may not earn enough to be required to file a tax return. They don't know. So they don't know that they're eligible. They don't know that they have a requirement to file, and so they don't file. And then there, there are those who don't want to file, those who are legally required, and they understand fully their obligation to file a tax return. But as Annalise mentioned earlier, for whatever reason, they may not be required. They may not, they may decide not to file. Next slide, please. So according to the IRS, um, EITC Central, th these, are, these are some of the things that we need to be on the lookout for, for those people who are eligible for the EITC but fall within that participation gap. It's likely going to be rural residents, people who are self-employed, those with disabilities, people without qualifying children, people who are non-English proficient, grandparents raising their grandchildren, and of course, households who are in a state of flux for whatever reason, um, unemployment, divorce, and a multitude of reasons, particularly over the course of the last year. Next slide, please. So we conducted a focus group um, with this cohort of six VITA programs who are across five states. So we're partnering with programs in South Carolina, in the Low Country, in United Way of Greenville County, in Georgia, Central Georgia, which is the Macon area, in Louisiana, in the Baton Rouge area, we're partnering with Capital Area United Way, Arkansas, the United Way of the Wachita's, and Texas, um, on the border, United Way of Southern Cameron County. So from this focus group, we identified a couple of key themes, which I think is, is um, I'm reiterating here, as, as my other co-panelists have already stated. Um, the first one is trust is an issue when reaching out to underserved populations, to non-filers and underserved populations. And so it is a big issue. It is key um, when we are looking to reach these populations and particularly to bring them a new service um, that it, it's in 
very important that they hear it from a trusted partner. Finally, partnerships and relationships with the trusted partners who are connected to the non-filers and underserved populations are key. And this is particularly for our VITA partners um, who are looking to, to reach more of the underserved populations. Um, it's essential that they have this the solid foundation relationships and partnerships with those trusted partners who are serving the populations that they're looking to serve. Next slide, please. So here are a few ways that you can help. Um, there, we like to put things in low touch, medium touch, high touch, and some of these have already been stated for you today. Um, but for low touch options are really just spread the word, you know, put up flyers in, in, you know, in your space, share messages, information, celebrate EITC Awareness Day, post banners on your website, um, use whatever resources you can, leverage your platform to spread the word. That's probably the easiest thing that you can do. The medium touch option is really make, make room, make space. I myself am a VITA volunteer, although my site was closed this filing season, um, but my site is actually in our county social services department. Um, so they make space for us on Saturdays. So if you can make space, then that's wonderful. If your office is somewhere where, you know, potential VITA clients are coming anywhere, any way, and it's a place that they're familiar and it's a place that they trust, then that makes it much easier for the VITA partner to be able to deliver and offer services there. Also join a local VITA coalition. Make sure you know who your VITA partner is in your area. Um, they will be instrumental um, to helping you to reach and, and find the right services and the, and the right way to deliver services to your audiences. Now, high touch is transform your space. Um, if you've got a spare conference room, you've got some extra space, um, transform it and allow you know your local VITA pro program to come in and borrow your space during the filing season um, so that you know the people who come in to, do, to receive services at your office can also have their taxes prepared there as well. And of course you can always engage your staff as volunteers, encourage them to volunteer and find ways to integrate the messaging around EITC and free tax prep services into your daily workflow really helps um, to make sure that the messages are heard and that they're delivered consistently. Consistently. Next slide, please. So here are a few more steps now, soon and later. So now is a great time where, you know, filing season is over. It's a great time to connect, reach out and connect with your VITA partners in your community. It's a great time to talk with them about baseline data. Like where is the need in your community? Identify where the most vulnerable and underserved populations are in your community and what resources are available and needed to serve them. And then you can choose your own adventure. This is a great time of year. June is great to start plan a great time to start planning for the next filing season. Um, so you can choose your own adventure. Decide what it is that you have the capacity to do in the next filing season. Low, medium, or high touch. You know, if all you can do is spread the word, then make a commitment and do that. That's wonderful. Um, every little bit helps. And then also you want to define success. So what will success look like after you've gone through the next six months of planning and then implementing during the filing season? What, what kind of outcomes would you like to see? Soon you want to develop that strategy and look for additional ways to support and engage. And then later, you know, after the 2022 filing season, you want to collect the data, evaluate the results, and start planning and getting ready for the next one. Next slide, please. So looking ahead, um, what we have coming down the pike in, as an organization is that we will complete our research on EITC outreach in barriers to participation, participation barriers and outreach strategy. And we will be releasing that later on in the fall this year, in September, October timeframe of this year, hopefully in time to help our partners to be able to digest the information and incorporate what we found into their strategies and their outreach strategies for the next filing season. Thank you. Next slide, please. I think that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And another thank you to all of our presenters for your time today. We truly appreciate it. Now we will move on to our question and answer portion. 
We will start with some questions that were submitted during the registration period for today's webinar. Our first question for our panelists is, can state earned income tax credits help prevent adverse childhood experiences? Would anyone like to answer that? I, want, I, I can take a, a, a first um, opportunity to answer that. And again, I wanted to um, echo Wendy's thanks to all the panelists. I learned so much. It was um, really fun and a delight. Um, I'll kick us off and then others please pipe in. Um, I will say that there's research that's supported by our CDC's Division of uh, Violence Prevention that shows refundable state EIDCs hold promise for preventing certain adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, including child abuse and neglect and exposure to adult psychological distress and suicides. There's an evidence brief, I believe, that's posted on our High Five website and we can share in a follow-up email. Um, they recognize that there's more research needed to understand how state EITCs affect other ACEs and to evaluate those changes in eligibility over time. I'll also acknowledge when we think beyond, there, there's, there is a body of research at Emory University um, looking at the impacts of refundable credits on states um, and showing um, positive associations with um, refundable credits at, at around 10% for um, uh, birth outcomes. Uh, I'll also mention more broadly, um, uh, not just state EITCs, but in federal EITCs, some emerging, emerging research in our centers for, National Center for Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities. They've conducted research showing that children and families receiving the EITC, this is including the federal, showed fewer behavioral health problems, including anxiety and depression. So um, we can share follow-up on that emerging research as well. Are there others that have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, I, you know, I think you did a really great job, Elizabeth, of kind of laying out the research that exists and, and I fully support that. And I, you know, we're seeing the, the same things in Massachusetts through the work of Essentials for Childhood and the work of Children's Health Watch. And I'd say, you know, for um, folks uh, tuning in and, and researchers tuning in, I would be really interested to see the, the findings that are will be coming out around pilots um, and that have already come out on pilots of the universal basic income, guaranteed minimum income, and the ways in which things like the EITC, both federal and state, the CTC, the uh, economic impact payments all coalesce together and have an impact on, you know, preventing or mitigating ACEs. So I think there's evidence out there and certainly the need for more in the future. We'll go on to our next question um, for our panelists. Uh, um, we've been interested in the connection between EITC and health for years, but have had trouble raising awareness with stakeholders until recently. Can you speak to any successes in implementation and awareness raising? Rebecca, would you like to? Don't mean to put you on the spot. Oh, I was gonna say it looked like Richard or Elizabeth wanted to chime in. Oh. You know, annual. Hopefully, the IRS hosts um, EITC Awareness Day, and we do a lot of work to help to, to raise awareness and really lift that up and provide the messages and resources for our partners to really um, advocate and raise awareness around the EITC. I will say that the most success, the most success that I have seen with regard to actually impacting people and making, converting EITC eligible non-filers or non-claimants to, you know, EITC eligibles who have claimed the tax return, claimed the credit um, and filed a return. The most success that we've seen has come one from, from last year with the economic impact payments um, as, as a vehicle to ensure that people were filing returns and getting into the system. And then the second has been through those trusted partner relationships from people hearing directly from someone who they are trusting to help with, you know, whatever issue or concern it is that they're face, that they're dealing with, I'm hearing directly from a trusted partner um, about the value of the EITC and getting that encouragement to have their tax returns filed has been like the most successful um, 
methods that, that I have seen so far among our partners. Yeah, I'll just add, you know, in the context of um, Boston Medical Center, the street cred model, I think has been really impactful. It, it speaks to what Rebecca was saying about trusted partners, you know, coming in to take your child in for his or her uh, annual well visit and then having a financial checkup with your pediatrician and then having a navigator talk to you about the ways in which you can, you know, uh, get the financial assistance that you need, especially the EITC is also, uh, I think, really impactful. And, you know, the, the healthcare provider can be a very, you know, trusted partner in that, in that equation. I will also just say, I think, um, you know, stories, we've had some uh, virtual events and, you know, evidence can move people, numbers can move certain people, but it's, it's really the stories of families themselves about how the EITC has had an impact on their lives that I think is really, really informative and can move move folks. Yeah, Richard, let's, let's, I think Annalise would like to jump in. Yes, I'd love to just double down on really what both Rebecca and Richard mentioned around the trusted partnerships, because we're starting to see in our data, as I mentioned, with our outreach partnerships, we like to give folks a unique URL that they can use and then we can track those clients. And we can not only see when they're visiting the website, but also really track them all the way through the process. and whether see whether they're successfully filing their taxes. And the partners that most successfully get new non-filers to file their taxes are um, public benefits agencies. So our partnership with the Virginia Department of Social Services and California Department of Services, and our partnership with Fresh EBT that works with SNAP clients. Those were the ones that were really able to not just get more people to visit the website, but actually give them the trust and confidence in our service to get them all the way through the process and, and to filing. So um, we're really excited to think more about how we can partner with government agencies in particular. Yeah, that makes total sense. I think Elizabeth, do you want to say something? Yeah, just one more echoing uh, my colleagues here in participating with the CDC Foundation work and developing the action guide and those stakeholder meetings. A lot of real emphasis on that health messaging and that health provider or a public health practitioner as being a trusted voice. So I think that is a really critical place to, you know, see, you know, just echoing what's heard here in, in those stakeholder engagements. Thank you. Yeah, and um, those are great answers. Our, our next question is actually from someone who works in early care and education, and they'd like to hear more about strategy, strategies which are applicable to childcare settings. Someone like to tackle that? I'm really excited to explore this further. It's not an area where we've done a lot of work yet, but I think sure. there's a ton of potential here, especially in the yeah. context of the new child tax credit. Um, we're very interested, depending on who is in those settings and figuring out how we can most effectively partner with people who are interested in providing various levels of service. So it could just be like Rebecca mentioned, a quick referral, or it could be something as complex as actually getting trained in how to coach people through either using Get Your Refund or um, the non-filer tool on the IRS website or other resources. So um, I think that there's tremendous potential working in childcare settings and with uh, folks like Nurse Family Partnership that, that uh, do home visits as well. All right. Um, Wendy, if you don't mind, um, I learned from a colleague here at CDC um, that had sent me a flyer um, that HHS Agency on Children and Families is partnering with Head Start Families to help access tax credits and supports through the American Rescue Plan. So the Head Start program is helping um, families understand and access tax credits through EITCoutreach.org. And they're connecting those eligible families through the free tax prep. So I think in addition, um, there are some additional investments that are, are, are helping with that, um, with early care settings. Okay. Um, a final question this afternoon, um, also for our panelists. Um, are there lessons we've learned from this policy implementation lab that could help us better understand the impact of other tax credits, such as the expansion of the child and dependent care tax credit. Yeah, I'll speak to that briefly. Just 
from the perspective of a, a participant in the implementation lab, I think there's a, a huge amount of value to be part of a community of practice or a learning network to learn from what is going on in other states, what similar agencies are experiencing, um, both you know wins and uh, barriers that they're finding. I think that's incredibly important and helpful. So I think knowledge sharing is um, is great. And you know even just like listening to Annalise and Rebecca and Elizabeth, you know, share during this Q and A has you know I've especially in the childcare aspect, it's something I'm not really too familiar with. And so just the knowledge sharing has been such a great aspect of that implementation lab. I, I would add um, the implementation lab is, uh, you know, just wrapped up a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so our colleagues who are leading us through that, the National Network of Public Health Institutes and the Georgia Health Policy Center are you know, sort of digesting um, the coaching calls and the information that we had through the webinars and sort of being or going to compile a report. So I think we'll have a lot more of the learnings and the type of dialogue that we've had here that will be distilled and distributed. So, you know, we hope that that can be another piece that can complement the action guide and the other materials out here um, to help folks um, engage in working in this important work. So I think the lessons learned are what we describing here are the conversations we were having in the lab and um, we're hoping to package that soon um, for distribution. Any other remarks concerning that? Okay. Um, Eli, do we want to take some questions from the chat, if there are any? I'm not sure if there are. I, we, we're happy to. I didn't see any in the Q&A. Okay. Uh, any closing remarks to our, our wonderful, from our wonderful panelists? And I'm I will say, I'd like to make a couple marks and kind of circle back to something that we talked about earlier. Um, when we right. think about EITC participation and the participation rate, it's actually a moving target. And it's a number that's really our best guest of it, of who might not be in the tax filing system, who might be eligible and not claiming based on census data. Um, what we will have in the coming months, which I'm like, Cross, crossing my fingers that by this time next year, that we will actually have some real solid data, like a better data set to help us to understand better where that EITC participation gap is, simply because there have been so many non-filers that have had to come into the tax administration system um, in order to capitalize and to reap the benefits of all of the, um, the benefits that have come the COVID-19 between CARES Act and ARPA, you know, folks have to have a tax return on file. So they have to get in the system, which actually gives us a better line of sight into where and who actually will need our help in the future. So I'm looking forward um, to, you know, this time next year when we actually have a, a much better line of sight into who those non-filers are still and where that EITC eligible population is still. I you know, I have a gut feeling that we are actually going to actually bring that number down. We've been hovering at 78 to 80 percent over the last several years. And so I'm hopeful that by the end of the next filing season, given the fact that we've had so many people, such an influx of new filers um, and lapsed filers into the system, that we will actually be able to help those folks actually claim that EITC um, and that they will continue to file and claim the EITC for as long as they're eligible and that we'll be able to, to chip away at that, that participation rate. I think that's said really beautifully, Rebecca. And um, part of what I've been trying to think of over the last few months is how do we sh really shift the perception of who needs to file taxes or who benefits from file taxes and build an, a, a self-identity as a filer for everyone? because. I think um, for it, there have been many logistical reasons why it makes sense to talk about certain people as non-filers previously or lapsed filers. Um, and 
I want to make sure that we're really getting the message across to everyone that filing taxes is for you, that this is a thing that makes sense for you to do every year and not just to get the stimulus checks, not just to get the advanced child tax credit, but to get other benefits like the EITC every single year. And so I'm really excited to think about how we can reach out to the folks who took that first step in filing one of those simplified returns and make sure we pull them into the system moving forward and, and get them every cent that they deserve of their tax benefits. So excited to partner with all of you on that. And, and I'll just add, you know, uh, it's been said, I think by everyone here, it, the, the importance of uh, free tax prep can't be, you know, it can't be understated. Um, and I'll say, you know, the IRS funds VITA sites, um, it doesn't cover the full cost of implementing, especially the, you know, potential like added capacity that's out there um, and, you know, Groups like Code for America and Prosperity Now do an amazing job, like greasing those wheels. States can also provide financial support to Vita sites. Massachusetts just began doing that a couple of years ago, and now they're funding it at eight hundred thousand dollars a year, which you know helps a lot, but it it also doesn't you know cover the full cost. And so I think um, having the EITC, the CTC, the expansions and improvements at the federal and state level is incredible, but supporting the free tax prep providers is, is also in, incredibly important as well. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today um, for our EITC and health webinar. Uh, we'd once again like to thank all of today's presenters sincerely for taking the time share their knowledge and resources with everyone. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the session is recorded and will be posted on the CDC uh, website. You'll receive an email on how to access, uh, access that recording once it's posted. Uh, once again, thank you everybody for joining today and have a good day. Thanks. Bye, thank you.